4.1 extreme values of functions. Um, so now we're going to start chapter 4, which has to do with mins and max um, values on graphs of equations and stuff like that. Okay, so at the beginning of the notes, I gave you the definition for the extreme value theorem. Um, and if I write EVT, that's what I'm talking about, extreme value theorem. If f is continuous on a closed interval, a, b, then f has both a minimum and a maximum on the interval. So this theorem says that if I have a function that is continuous, and this is a requirement, on an interval that is closed, that's another requirement, then automatically um, the function f will have a minimum and a maximum on that interval. So, the pictures are basically examples of mins and maxes on a closed interval. So the first one, and if you remember mins and maxes from pre-calc, this right here is the minimum, this is the max, and this is a continuous function, and I'm, I am talking about this one right here. This is a continuous function, and it's on a closed interval from A to B. Okay, the second picture this is my minimum, I'm sorry, my maximum, and this is my minimum. It happens to be the endpoints, but that's okay. Um, it is a closed interval, and it is continuous. Um, the next one, again, a closed interval up here. This is my max. It kind of looks like a parabola, but they chopped a piece off of it. And the minimum would be the smallest or the lowest point, and the lowest point um, would be right there because they chopped the other side off. Um, so there can be a combination of a maximum in the interior on the inside and then a, min a minimum at an endpoint. The next one um, is, I guess, vice versa. The minimum is in the interior and then the maximum is at an endpoint. But these are all examples of the extreme value theorem. The fact that because it is continuous, because it's on a closed interval, there is a highest and lowest point. Okay, so uh, here's some words, right? I do want you to write them down. I apologize if I didn't leave enough space. It's not a lot. Um, so go ahead and copy this down. Um, and I am missing some words or not words, symbols, I just didn't want to mess with how to make the symbol. Um, but I'll talk about it and then you can copy it down with the power of pause, right? Local extreme values. Okay, so when we have a local extreme value, which is also called relative, um, a relative value, uh, this is where the function is or has a maximum or minimum. It's not necessarily the most maximum <laughs> or the most minimum. It's not the, ex the a lowest, lowest point. It's not the highest, highest point. It's just low and high. <laughs> Might be confusing, but I have a picture. Um, global extreme values or absolute values um, are the highest the lowest points. Okay, so there is a difference. Um, if a function for local extreme values, if a function f has a local maximum minimum um, in the interior of the domain, so not at the endpoints, um, then f prime, and if f prime exists, then the first derivative equals zero at that point c. Okay, so this is what this is saying basically I'm going to be able to find a maximum or a minimum wherever my derivative equals zero. Remember derivative is slope. Um, so if the derivative which is slope equals zero, if the slope equals zero that means that this will be a location on a graph where I can make a tangent line that is going to be horizontal. Okay? So um, Here's a max, right? 
the tangent line on the tippity top would be a horizontal line, and therefore uh, my derivative would be zero because my slope is zero. Okay, global extrema, same thing, will be located wherever um, I, what is it called, the derivative equals zero, but um, they can also be located at the endpoints, and I need to fill in something. Oh yeah, if f of x is less than or equal to f of c, so basically there's an x value called c, and if all the other x's are smaller than that c, right, then f of c is an absolute maximum. Um, for if f of x is greater than or equal to f of c, so that means um, if there are a bunch of, if there's any x or most x's on the graph or all the x's are bigger than this itty bitty little c, um, then c is going to be the absolute minimum. Okay, so that's all that's saying. Jargon is really not that, it's really not necessary to complicate it this much, but this is the proper definition. So basically the maximum, if it's the biggest value, right, if it's the biggest y value at that x value, um, then it is the maximum. Um, for the minimum, if it is the smallest y, then it is the minimum. Okay, critical points. Okay, a critical point is a point in the interior of the domain of a function f, where f prime equals zero, so again, the slope is zero, or f prime does not exist. So for critical points, um, it is a critical point if the derivative does not exist or if the derivative equals zero. Now, um, in cases where just where um, the derivative equals zero, these points can also be called stationary. Um, critical points and stationary points are not necessarily the same thing um, because critical points exist where the derivative does not. Stationary points only exist where the derivative equals zero. And then finally, a last piece of note here. Um, basically, extreme values are going to occur at endpoints or critical points. Okay, so, and we'll be checking both on some of the examples anyway. All right, make sure you copy all that down. Okay, um, here's a picture explaining the idea between absolute and local. Um, remember, absolute uses the word global, and local sometimes uses the word relative. Um, so, just think if it's global and local. Local is nearby, global is the whole thing. Okay, absolute, that word means totally, so the whole thing, right? Um, and then relative, uh, doesn't mean everything, it just means uh, nearby. Think about that. Okay, so um, looking at the picture here, you can see that we have some, quite a few minimums and quite a few maximums. So let's see. Uh, let's go with green. So here's a max. Here's a max. Right? There's two maximums, but one of them is a lot higher than the other. So the one that's higher is going to be the absolute. Okay? The other one is just the local, the relative max. Because in this area, it is the highest point, but it's not the highest point on the whole graph. Okay? All right. Um, let's see. Minimums. So here's a minimum, right? That's a low point. Here's a minimum. That's also a low point. And here's a minimum. That's also a low point. But which one is the lowest? Obviously, this one's the lowest. Therefore, it's called the absolute minimum. And then this one is the lowest point in its neighborhood. And this one is the lowest point in its neighborhood. They're still minimums. 
um, but they're only local minimums. Usually, um, usually we're trying to find the absolute. Okay. All right, proceeding. Example one, I need you to adjust the picture for A. I was supposed to make those open circle, and I forgot. So the endpoints, they're little open circles, just like my picture. Your picture, they look closed. They're blue dots. Well, I need you to um, fake it and make them little open circles, okay? All right, so example one, identify each x value at which any absolute extreme value occurs. Absolute, we're not doing the relative or the local. Explain how your answer is consistent with the extreme value theorem. Okay, extreme value theorem. If f is continuous on a closed interval AB, then f has both a minimum and a maximum on the interval. All right, so for A, let's look at this. Um, so we have a minimum here, but that's an open circle. So let's see, we have a maximum here. Um, we have a minimum here. <laughs> and we have a um, maximum there, but that's also an open circle. So really, um, our closed or open circles, right? They're no good for us. So what I have is a maximum. at x equals c1. And I have a minimum at x equals c2. Now, if I read the instructions, it said, identify each x value at which any absolute extreme value occurs. So we did that. Explain how your answer is consistent with the extreme value theorem. OK, so. Is it consistent with the extreme value theorem? Well, the extreme value theorem says um, in order for it to apply, the function must be continuous. And for the most part, this function is continuous except for the endpoints. Um, the endpoints are open, so therefore, the extreme value theorem does not apply. Um, so this is, let me, wait. I need to erase that. Okay. So, this is my explanation. The extreme value theorem does not apply because the function h is not defined on a closed interval. So, b, I'm going to do the same thing. I need to find the mins and the maxes, right? So, this is a closed interval. It is continuous. So, the extreme value theorem is going to apply. I just need to find what is the highest point and what is the lowest point. So, here's the highest point. So maximum at x equals c, and the lowest point is right here. So minimum at x equals b. And then how does does the extreme value theorem apply? And like I said, it does. Um, the EVT applies because the function f is continuous on the closed interval a b so both a minimum and a maximum do exist okay next <sighs> all right critical numbers if f has a relative minimum or relative maximum at x equals c then c is a critical number of f okay so if um, i have a max or a min at a certain x value Right? If that is a location of a minimum or a maximum, then that location, that C, that X, is considered a critical number. Okay, so example two, um, we're going to find critical numbers, critical points. Okay, so uh, it says find the critical point of f of X equals 3X squared minus 24X minus 1 on the interval from negative 1 to 5. Okay, so first, step one, derive. Okay, so f prime of x equals 6x minus 24. There's my derivative. Set, uh, step two, set equal to zero, solve for x. So 6x minus 24 
equals 0. Let's see, I get 6x equals 24. Divide by 6, divide by 6, x equals 4. Okay, I solved for x. x is 4. This is my critical number, my critical value. Um, step 3, make sure your critical numbers exist in the given interval. So this time around, I only have 1. Um, but I want to make sure that this number is actually in the interval they gave me because sometimes you get three um, and not all of them will be critical points because or critical values because not all of them might be in the interval. Four, luckily, is in the interval, right? It's in right before the five. All right, step five, four. Um, if they want a point, most likely they're going to actually want a coordinate. Okay, so... Um, just keep in mind, if they want a point, most likely it's actually a coordinate. So you have an X, right? Um, so what you need to do is find a Y. Now, right now, I don't know if this is a minimum or a maximum because we're not there yet. But this is a potential location for a minimum or a maximum. Um, so step four, find Y. And the way you would find Y is just to plug it in. Right? So I take my original equation. Plug in the 4, and then that's how I would find y. So 3 times 4 squared minus 24 times 4 minus 1. And whatever you get from there, that is your y. All right, I did the calculations, and as long as I didn't do my math incorrectly, uh, 16, that should be right. So negative 49, so therefore uh, my critical point. <laughs> Critical point um, is uh, 4, negative 49. And there you go. All right, next. Um, number Example 3, same thing. Exact same thing. Only I don't have the steps here. Um, but I'm going to derive. So 18x squared minus 24x cubed. Alright, so I take my derivative, and I set it equal to 0. Um, I see that I have a greatest common factor of 6x squared. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that out. So let's see, 18 divided by 6, that's 3. 24x um, cubed divided by 6x squared is going to be negative 4x. And so what I have here x is 0, and here um, I have x equals 3 fourths. So these are my critical values. Okay, so um, I need to make sure that they're in the interval. The interval is negative 1 to 2, so these numbers are in my interval, so I'm good on that. And then all I need is the actual y values. So I would take um, my original function, plug in 0, so let's see, 0 minus 0 plus 5, that was easy. Um, and then my original function, plug in 3 fourths, and of course this is not going to be easy. Let's see what we get. Alright, with the help of my handy dandy calculator, I got 14.75. Alright, so, um, critical points at um, 0, 5, and uh, 3 fourths, or 0. 0.75, whatever floats your boat, 14.75, or 14 and 3 quarters, whatever floats your boat. Okay. And this is a 0. Wait. Next. Last example. Um, right? Or am I wrong? Second to the last example? Okay. Um, guidelines for finding extrema in a closed interval. So here I have some steps for you. Uh, to find the extrema of a, con of a continuous function f on a closed interval a, b, use these steps. One, find the critical numbers of f in the open interval a to b. Um, evaluate f at each critical number in the open interval a to b. Then evaluate f at each endpoint of the closed interval from a to b. So obviously the critical numbers are not going to be the endpoints. That's why it says um, to. That's why it says the open interval. 
but then you are actually going to evaluate the endpoints as well. And then um, whichever one is the biggest is the maximum, whichever is the smallest is the minimum. Okay, so I wrote out the steps. Example four, finding extrema in a closed interval. Find the extrema of f of x equals 3x to, uh, to the fourth power minus 4x cubed on the interval uh, from negative 1 to 2. So obviously those are my endpoints, so I will be using them. So one, step one, find um, critical values, and we just did that twice. So we're going to derive. Let me do it with the green. So f prime of x equals 12x cubed minus 12x squared. Now I take this, I set it equal to 0, and I find my x values. Alright, so I see I have a common factor, a GCF, of 12x squared. So I'm going to pull that out, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be left with just x minus 1 equals 0. So I have x equals 0, and I have x equals 1. So let me make sure those are in my interval. Yes, they are. Okay, I can move on. Evaluate f at the critical numbers. So I'm going to take my f, my function, and I'm going to plug in 0. And I'm going to take my function, and I'm going to plug in 1. So let's see. If I plug in 0, I get 0 minus 0, which is 0. If I plug in 1, um, let's see. What did I get? Um, I got 7. Nope. 1. I got 1. Oh, let's see. 3 minus 4. Is 3 minus 4? Is that right? So it is negative 1. All right. Um, okay, proceeding. Um, step 3, evaluate f at the endpoints. So now I'm going to use my endpoints. All right, so I'm going to plug in my endpoints, and my endpoints are negative 1 and 2. So f of negative 1 and f of 2, I'm going to plug those in. Um, so when I plug in negative 1, I get 7. And when I plug in positive 2, I get 16. All right, step 4. Um, determine the minimum and maximum. Okay, so looking at these, all I really have to do is be like, oh, this is the biggest and this is the smallest. So let's see. I've got 0, negative 1, 7, and 16. So obviously negative 1 is the smallest number. So negative 1 is the location of the minimum. So I would say minimum value, or the minimum value, whatever, is negative 1 at x equals 1. And then looking at these, I have to find the biggest, right? The biggest number of them all, and that's 16. So then I could say maximum value is 16 at x equals 2. And there you go, we just found the extrema on uh, this interval. Next. Okay, example five. Finding extrema using a sign chart. Now this is going to be your best friend in this class. Um, and it does not go away, and you do have to know how to do it. Uh, so find the extreme values of the function, and the function is yucky. And where they occur. So not only am I finding the values, I'm finding out where it happens. So it's basically like a point or an x and a y. Just make sure you provide an x and a y. All right, step one, same, find critical numbers. So you are going to derive. Let's see, y prime, let's see, 4 times 3, that's 12. 12 divided by 2, that's 6x cubed. Plus 3 times 4 is 12x squared minus 18x, and the 10 goes away. So now I take this, I set it equal to 0. and I solve for x. Now, I see that they all have an x in common, so I can pull that out, and they all have 6, the number 6 in common. So let's see, 6x cubed becomes x squared, 12x squared becomes 2x, and then negative 18x becomes negative 3. Alright, so, factor. 
Let's see, I need two numbers that multiply up to negative 3 and add up to positive 2. So 3 and 1 definitely multiply up to 3, um, but it has to be negative. So if I make this positive, I'm going to make this one negative. Ne uh, positive 3 minus 1 is 2. So there you go. Factored. And what do I have? Here I have x equals 0. Here I have x equals negative 3. And here I have x equals positive 1. So those are my three critical numbers. Okay, notice I do not have an interval here. So no interval, no need to check the endpoints. Okay, number two, make a number line with critical numbers. Choose values to either side of each critical number. All right, so here's the sign chart. It is a number line. It's a basic number line. So here's a, well, you know what? Let me use my smart board. Why not? It's here. Might as well put it to good use. So I can actually get a straight line. Hee hee hee. Alright, so I was going to draw it right here. There's my line. Okay. So, make a number line. Here's my number line. And I'm going to use my critical values. So, let's see. 0, negative 3, um, and 1. So, here's negative 3. Uh, oh boy, one, two, here's zero, and, well, let me make more space. Okay, negative three, zero, one, right? Okay, now, um, I need you to also choose, I need you to also choose values to either side of each critical number. Okay, I'm going to pick other numbers. So, let's see. Um, to the left of negative 3, right here, I'm going to pick negative 4. To the right of negative 3, I can pick 1 or negative 2. Negative 1 or negative 2. I'm going to pick negative 1 because it's easier to plug in. Um, to the right of 0, I need to pick a number, which is also to the left of 1. So it has to be in here somewhere, um, so the easiest number to pick would just be 0.5. And then I need to pick one to the right of 1, so that's going to be 2. Okay, now see, I have a number in between all the numbers, just 1. It really doesn't matter which one, as long as it actually goes there. Okay, between negative 3 and 0, I could have picked negative 1 or negative 2, or negative 1.5, or negative 2.5, but I could not have picked negative 3.5, okay? All right, so there are my values. Okay, now next. Evaluate f, f prime at each chosen value. So that means I'm going to take my derivative, and I'm going to plug in these values that I have chosen. And there's four of them, right? Let's see. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Okay, so let me, let, I picked negative 4, I picked negative 1, uh, I picked 0.5 or 1 half, and I picked 2. Okay, so you plug them into your derivative, right? Notice, I am plugging this into the derivative, really important. And I'm out of breath. Okay, so you plug them into the derivative and you get a number back out. So let's see, plug in negative 4. I get negative 120, plug in negative 1, I get 24, uh, plug in 0.5, I get negative 5.25, oh, that looks horrible, <sighs> negative 5.25, there you go, better, and then if you plug in 2, you get 60, alright, step 4, Use these y values, right? Those numbers I just wrote down in the purple, those are y values. Use these y values to label the number line with signs positive or negative, okay? Now, this is how this is going to work. Um, for the first one, this one right here, right? I hope you can see that. Add f, of, f prime of negative 4 
I got a y value of negative 120. Okay, it's a negative number. So that determines my sign. So my sign right above the negative 4 is going to be a negative. Okay, so proceeding. Above the negative 1, I have a positive 24. So above the negative 1, it's going to be a plus. Um, the 0.5, I got a negative 5.25. So above the 0.5, it's going to be a negative. And then for the 2, I got a positive 60, so that's a positive. All right, so these are my signs. That's why it's called a sign chart. Okay, number 5. Using, or sorry, use sign chart to determine where the extreme values occur. All right, so let me bring this down. Okay, so I brought it down. And I want to make borders so that you can see. Okay, here's my first border. That's with my critical value, right? This is my critical value. This was also a critical value, so there's my other border. And here's my other critical value. Okay, now, the signs basically tell me what's happening there. So to the left of negative 3, um, my function, my original function, now realize we did all of this with the derivative, but my original function is actually decreasing. Okay, negative means decreasing. To the right of 3, or negative 3, sorry, I have a plus. So to the right of negative 3, my function is increasing. Alright, next, the 0. To the left of 0, I have a big fat plus right there. So that means to the left of 0, my function is increasing. And of course, you get the hang of this after doing it all year long. Um, to the right of 0, it's negative, so it's going to be decreasing. To the left of 1, I have a big fat negative. So again, decreasing. But to the right of 1, I have a nice positive, so increasing. So now if you look at these, they kind of look like graphs. And right here, right, that would be a minimum. So I have a minimum, you know what, let me just write min and max from now on. I have a minimum at x equals negative 3. Um, for 0, if you look, this looks like a top, um, uh, a high point. So I have a max at x equals 0. And for the 1, this is also a minimum. So I have a min at x equals 1. And that's how you determine if it's a min or a max, using a sign chart. Um, step 6 says evaluate f at each critical number to find the y value for your coordinate. So I have my critical numbers, and I know that it's a minimum at x equals negative 3, and I know it's a maximum at x equals 0, and a minimum at x equals 1. But if um, they actually ask you for where they occur, and they want points and stuff like that, then you do have to plug in y. Okay? So without rewriting all of this, let me just go ahead and tell you, the minimum is located at negative 3, and when I plug in y into the original function, because if you want y, it's always into the original function. Let's see, I get negative 57.5. Okay, when I plug in 0, I get 0, 10. Well, the y is 10. And when I plug in 1, I get 6.5. Okay, so my minimum is located at negative 3, negative 57.5 and 1, 6.5. My max is located at 0, 10. Okay, that's it. You have homework in the textbook. Peace out.